The animation industry had some false starts until, you know, out of the blue, uh, the IDA uh, discovered that animation can create jobs. And so there were a lot of semi-skilled jobs available in the animation industry, cell painting, back in the day of cell painting. Sullivan Bluet decided to set up here. Bluet uh, was a sort of a, if you can, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, born again Disney. He really believed that two, you know, two dimensional drawings at Disney work was sellable and Disney had more or less given up on that. A man called Sullivan helped him out and he was Irish American and he, he would have opened up a car making factory here just as easy. But he and Blewett got together and they opened up an animation industry and the IDA was into it because they heard they could have immediately 200 jobs, semi-skilled jobs, cell painting there and then. Would you consider looking at Ireland? We have a great program to bring in new industry. And what happened though in, in Ireland is we were the IDA was giving us grants to train people. Grants means money, <laughs> and money is what we didn't have. So what we did is we decided, and he, Morris had a big part of this, decided we will go to Ireland. And up to that point, my name was on the was the first name on the studio, right? But he said, no, I'm Irish, they'll know this. And so he says it's Sullivan Bluth, and we changed it. Now, we had to pay our own flights. And all, we had 87 people in their families to get to Ireland. The money we got, a million and a half dollars, is what it cost to get our crew to Ireland. We sat up there. We, we were discussing what this was going to be, American Tale. And uh, when Universal told us, we told them, well, for, if we're doing this with the union, it's going to cost about 11.4 million. Well, we're not going to spend 11.4 million. Universal came back and said, we'll give you 7.5. We went, whoa, 7.5, that's like 40% less than what we need. No, we were a limping, you know, broken wing bird trying to fly. So when we offered that we would go back to salaries from two years before and it'll be st it'll be frozen for the whole time and you only get one week off for the whole time. Everybody raised his hand and said, I, I'm with you. I would have worked there for nothing at the time. I was so into it, I would have worked the first you know, six months, eight months, almost a year that I was there, literally like a, a, a kid in a sweet shop. I could not get enough of it. We were fanatical, really. I mean, we were like 21, 22. You know, we were young, we were out of college. Uh, some of the guys had never went to art college and they'd come in from different points of view, from printing or from one guy. Was like, I think he made stained glass, but he had a talent for drawing characters and he just got a job there. It was a really interesting hodgepodge. It wasn't like everybody came out of some kind of college system with a standardized notion of what animation could or should be. Bluth gave us that. There weren't any educational courses in animation uh, originally, although Bluth encouraged Ali Fermat to take the syllabus from Sheridan College in Toronto and apply that here and brought over uh, lecturers and teachers uh, to run the course. Bluths were very keen and very helpful, in fact, to get involved as well. Bally Fairman had a reputation for trying to create a, a, an, an, an opportunity for third level education in a working class area of Bally Fairman. Not only do we have some big studios in Dublin now, we have this top class American animation course happening in Ireland as well. Within six months of my graduation, 90% of my class had emigrated. And I thought, well, that's, that's me. And then one day the phone rang and said, um, how would you like to work on a Steven Spielberg film? And I said, uh, let me get back to you. Okay. <laughs> and it turned out that they were setting up a studio, it's called Sullivan Studios, in uh, Glandor House in Malahide. And it was for cell painting on a film called An American Tale. And the test involved seeing if you could paint between the lines. And 
I actually could. I think I probably would have been here because if he hadn't seen me that day, I would have come back the next day and I would have come back the day after that, you know, as much as I could. As I was determined, it was nothing was going to stop me getting hired there. For Ireland, it was brilliant, you know. Out of all the countries in the world that that studio could have landed in, you know, they came to Dublin and it was, it was amazing. When I went in there, it was just like, I know nothing, absolutely nothing. It's like Disney coming to Ireland, a new studio opening up, it's going to be great. And, and then, of course, when you're in there, then you hear about Don and Gary and being at Disney and you're like, wow, they were just like the gods, you know? Actually, they really did invest in us, you know what I mean? There was all sorts of uh, training courses, after work, and you could approach anybody and ask them for any help. And, and they were all willing, you know? But now it felt like I was jumping into like a professional, uh, a professional environment. And it turned out to be kind of the opposite in a weird way. Like when I arrived in Dublin and I kind of met the crew I'd be working with, um, I realized like most of them were, were, were rookies as well. And we were all figuring it out together. I think the, the environment of the studio was just very, overall very kind of uh, electric and fun and um, very young, you know, overall quite young staff. And then there was Don Bluth, who was sort of this mythic figure, you know, who might kind of coast through your department every now and then. Uh, and he had, he had such a great history and mythos behind him with uh, having left Disney and brought a bunch of really talented folks with him in those first few films that had so much artistic integrity to them. Uh, that we, they were, we were all on board with the promise of what that place was. The whole... Uh, idea within the studio was that you could do what, whatever you're capable of and they weren't going to hold you down. Most of the people there were from 18 to 25 probably and yeah there was a lot of young kids so it would be like going to college basically and it was that kind of atmosphere. The end of the Lamfort time and everything sort of shifted and changed in Southampton. The first out of the, the traps was going to be all dogs go to heaven. The sense in the studio was very much like, now we're making our films. There was an air of confidence and an air of real adventure. And everybody wanted to achieve the end goal. And the end goal was always the feature film for a release. Animated features in those days took three to 500 people, two to three years to create. They're massive projects. To have a crew of people, and I think this is where where Don and Gary did hugely good work by encouraging everybody around them. The culture was always how to create something visually beautiful, and they did a great job of doing it. It was very exciting. It was exciting because there was nothing like that ever before in Ireland, and we were the biggest employer not just in the sector but we were the animation industry in Ireland for a very long time and the biggest animation company in Europe and Don for a time his films were beating Disney at the box office. It was like a family. It, we spent so much time together all the time and um, for a lot of us it had been very formative years you know in our uh, professional careers and we shared a common vision and We'd had a lot of laughs along the way. And I see people on my Facebook and on the Don Booth Films Facebook all the time that are ex-employees that are now working at DreamWorks or Disney or um, Sony, even Pixar. Um, they're always on there and they're always making comments about what it was like when we worked in Ireland. And I think somebody put a special page up that was, uh, we all worked in Ireland for Don Booth. Two of us kind of realizing at the same time, was like, you know, we were we were actually some of the first animators in Ireland. You don't even think about it, you know? They inspired us to believe that we were building a studio and we were building films, we were making films there that were world class, and they were. I arrived in 1990. I think the, the point that they were trying to prove had been proven in a way with The Secret of Nim and Land Before Time. I was hired on to a troll in Central Park, and then I went on to work on Thumbelina, not their most stellar films. At the end, I can remember lots of people got, got let go. A lot of us had been there nearly 10 years, and our, so our experience levels were huge, 
and we all thought this is a going concern. Why can't we just why can't we just continue on as a studio? Of course, it's, it all comes down to money. And then the liquidation happened, and prior to that, things were on shaky ground. And then all of a sudden, one day, the doors were just closed, and people were left to fend for themselves. And we all had to scatter about and try to land jobs, you know, at Disney Paris or any other animation studios that were hiring. But it was a desperate scramble. And I think when some of us were hired back after that liquidation, for those next two years, the atmosphere had changed a lot. It was no longer no longer kind of fun-loving and uh, uh, you know, spirited. It was a little bit more, yeah, a little. A little bit more of a depressing atmosphere was in the studio. You have to be sure that the picture makes money or you won't live to make another one. And I think our series of falls when we had our studio had to do with the fact that we made uh, sometimes not very wise business decisions. There are probably three parts to that um, answer. I mean, the, the direct reason that the studio closed was that we were bought, as a, as a company, we were bought by a company called Media Asia, which is part of Star TV. And then they realized that we had a long-term distribution deal with Warner Brothers, which, which I'd negotiated, which is a great deal while we were independent. But it basically meant that every dollar that um, News Corp would put in to finance the studio was going to make 25%, 25 cents in distribution fees for their rivals. So we were a strategic anathema. So they decided to close the studio so that we would continue making them movies for Warner and you know Don's films went from you know being doing really really well at the box office to not doing so well at the box office and after a while you ran out of money the bank goes so we were going belly up in Ireland where we thought it was about animation when we left Disney's you know we're gonna we're gonna put back in the shadows under the feet we're gonna put the sparkles on the water we're gonna put the smoke going up we're gonna, you know, all that stuff that's mechanical was a little bit out of tune but what I think that we have discovered in our careers is that it's about the story you're telling and does the audience get to identify with it. And if they don't, you kill animation. And I think that's probably why traditional is we stop telling stories. The studio shut. Um, I think it was the second or third liquidation at that stage. So it was very clear what was going to happen and it was closed, it wasn't going to come back. Cheering off it closes and it's just devastating. I remember being really down for a few weeks, a couple of months afterwards going, oh no, it's gone, you know. And then even still now when you drive past the building, it's still there and you're like, oh, we had some great days there. Yeah, I was, I was convinced that studio was going to be the rain for a very long time, so I'm sad that it, that, that had happened. Um, but then I was thinking like, okay, you got like maybe 500 people in the studio, trained by some of the best in the world. We were offered a job at, uh, at 20th Century Fox, and Bill Mechanic, who was the president at the time, came over and talked to us and had dinner with us and everything and said, you know, come over here and start an animation studio here. Then came the trek back to the United States with all of the people, and some of the people we'd collected from Ireland and all came back with their dogs and their cats and their wives and their kids and all that, removing again and starting all over again with another studio. I still have my old passports because of the number of stamps that are, that are in there for US immigration. Um, uh, it opened, they opened the world to me and I'll never forget that. Never. The uh, experience of working in LA with these huge stars and working alongside incredible professionals, you know, that, that are never, you know, they're never lauded or anything. But if you look down the end of, of the credits on films and you see who the re-recording mixers are, who people, the, their talents are incredible. And, and to be able to work alongside them meant I was able to soak up their knowledge. For a kid like me from Rohini to end up uh, working in Hollywood um, was like a dream. And which made the end even sad. There should be statues to the legacy of those guys. It, it, it'll live on. They changed the lives of so many people. When Sullivan Blue shut down, it sent, you know, a lot of Irish animators to Arizona. 
And then some of us stayed behind, some people went to Paris. But there was a general assumption that without the Americans running things, it would be very, very difficult to repeat that or maybe impossible. But there was a feeling at the time in Europe that it was somehow failed and none of the groupings actually stayed together. All of the uh, studios went their own separate ways. Well, even the bigger studios were in decline. So I'd say it was, it was pretty grim. Um, there was very few people working independently in animation. If they wanted to continue with the career, a choice to either stay and sort of start your own studio or go abroad. All through college, I was just saying, I'm going, I'm going to England. I mean, we used to fantasize about like sending abroad thing one day, but it was very much a fantasy. And we almost like we really accepted the fact that we'd have to go to at least the UK to work for. We said like, oh, we work in the UK for a year in a games company, earn some money, then go to Canada maybe, where there's a bigger industry. When we came out of college. I think when my year graduated, there was about 12 people in the class, and I think 11 of them went to, 10 of them went to the UK into, straight into the games industry, all at the same company. And then another guy, Tom Caulfield, went to, down to the saloon, and I was gone to the state. We kind of lost almost a whole generation. There was initially disbelief that suddenly it was all falling apart, but then more younger people realizing, well, hang on, we could maybe start to do some of this ourselves. It was just a, a very exciting time as well. It was trying to figure out just how do you get things made. Everything was crossing over from analog into digital. Um, the days of shooting on film were coming to an end. And there was a lot of change, but because we were just starting then, it, we, were, we were like right on the crest of that wave. So it just felt like a very exciting time. There was a good community spirit there because a lot of us knew each other from college. And we were all trying to figure out how to get that next step. Everybody sort of reconnected in their own places wherever they landed. It's always been a really supportive network of friends because we all really started as friends. Well, I think there was never a desire to move abroad because we, we really, we, we love being in Ireland and, and we wanted to make, you know, content that was relevant to here at the time. The real motivation for setting up Brown Bag was the fact that nobody else was going to allow us to do the things we wanted to do. Give Up Your Old Sins was a, was a huge surprise. I mean, it was Cole's idea to do it as a short. And again, it was just something that, there was no master plan. He just had heard the radio recording and really wanted to see what it would be like making that little girl's voice come alive. And so really we just made it for ourselves. We showed it in Dublin and it got a really good reaction. We thought, yeah, but nobody outside Dublin's gonna get it. And then we showed it at the Galway Film Festival and it won there and we were like, oh my God, then it won at Cork. And then it won in the UK and it started to win prizes in America. And we were like, oh my God, what's going on here? But when it got the Oscar nomination, I mean, yeah, we were bowled over. I mean, that was a huge surprise. When we started out, the the budgets for TV shows are probably bigger than they are now, but there's, there was far fewer of them getting made. The thing now is there's so many channels out there and you've got all the digital channels coming in that they just need all of this content to, you know, feed all of these various outlets. Everyone wants to help each other. I mean, Brown Bike helped us. They were like, well, if you guys become good and big, you're going to attract more great artists to this yeah. country that we can use and then you can use air talent and stuff and so on. So I think it's a very healthy environment. And the barriers to entry have dropped dramatically, uh, which is probably why we have 20 odd studios as part of Animation Ireland now, as opposed to seven or eight, five to 10 years ago. We were working from our middle bedroom, you know, um, there were two of us in there and we were trying to get a bit of service work in to pay a few bills and, you know, try to kind of build up a bit of a brand for ourselves, a bit of a reputation. The second leap that we took was coming out of the middle bedroom um, into the studio here in the Liffey Trust. Um, which was amazing. I mean, we were terrified, yeah. uh, absolutely terrified at the time. But, you know, we were like, we just have to do it. We have to bite the bullet, bite the bullet move out, get a premises. I think the more the merrier. I don't think it's something that should ever be, you know, okay, that's enough. We have enough studios in Ireland now. I, I think it's fantastic. There's room for everyone. And it is a community. Um, it's a pool of talent that they, ha they should all be able to pull from. Uh, so the first thing we did was made a trailer, which is in a style that's 
but to me and were quite different from what the, the finished uh, product ended up as but it was enough to take to the markets to to the european markets and to uh, show you know what we'd done and to explain what the project was we kind of learned on the job like i remember jerry uh, sheeran uh, he was running terribly at the time told us a lot about how you can get the finance together for a feature even cotton and brown bag gives a loan about kind of a, a book that cartoon the media uh, branch of the eu had done a book about you know cartoon co-productions and like a lot of people are kind of going you're mad but if you're going to do it here's how you go about we're not making the same mistakes we're making you know a different set of mistakes as we as we continue on um but it's so it's all you know you never know it all and you never know the correct way to do something the thing is as well you need a, a certain amount of enthusiasm and naivety to to be doing this kind of stuff because again it's a it's a labor of love I think that was even a bit disillusioned. Some of the people that have come down were a bit disillusioned because they sort of came down to make a film and then it turned into, oh, let's make a trailer to raise the money to make the film. And it, I was really delighted then by like 2005, like five years later, we finally had to finance together. And a lot of those people who had originally come down had kind of drifted away and were working elsewhere. They all were willing to kind of come back again because they were like, oh, you're finally going into production. We attracted Les Amateurs, we're a French uh, company. Uh, first off, and then uh, a Belgian company subsequently. And Secret Cells was very draining on the company financially, you know, and then uh, our TV series Kung Fu took a while to, to sort of pay for itself as well. So we were in a kind of tight spot when we finished both those projects. That European co-production model leaves the, me, for example, as the director, I'm also a producer because I'm a co-owner of the company, in a position where I kind of have the final say. I mean, I take the notes from everybody um, and, and I listen because they're all co-producers, but they don't have enough of a single investment in the film to be able to tell me, no, change it, or to fire me. You know, we are branching now into feature films. I mean, Cartoon Saloon is doing it. And Cartoon Saloon is a classic example of this. They're, if you look at the richness and the quality of it, it's very, very European. And an awful lot of their references and their artwork is European. But the animation of people throwing themselves around, it's got a very American quality to it. And it's no, it's no accident that they loved it in America and it got nominated in America. But you know what's mad? The fact that people are surprised that it's an Irish story just shows how conditioned we are. That if every show has to be set in New York, or every film is set in New York, you know, why not? Like, people should be saying, like, why not? Why not make an Irish film? Always at the heart of it, we had the kind of illustration or traditional uh, media look that we always try to keep. But we've also had a kind of forward-thinking approach that if you're working with a limited budget, you have to be clever about how you get that look and so sometimes that look is achieved with like pencil and paper and um, but sometimes you can achieve that look just as well or even better using software in a clever way so there's always been a bit of a guerrilla attitude so we've always mixed and matched with other software we needed to you know to make things work Irish artists have found a new way to sort of express themselves with new tools they've just jumped in and grab grabbed a hold of it as a storytelling tool and we just keep keep going you know which is which is really great where Silver Blues was more of a very Disney-esque uh, way of going, lovely, beautiful styles. Definitely Ireland has its own style, I think, as well. The skill sets that have been built up in management, in the various people running the studios now for several, you know, 10, 12 years, um, that's a lot of management, management skill. They know how to sell movies, they know how to make movies, how to pitch them to various people who's going to buy them, how to actually put the team together. It's a huge skill set of artists here and technicians now, which wouldn't have been here 10 years ago. I don't think the model in the 80s and 90s could have worked that we have Sustained. now. It was, it was a different model, it was more like a kind of a, um, a, maybe more like Google or Amazon or some company. You know what I mean? It was like a big company having a base in Ireland and maybe it was to, to do with low cost labour and different things like that. Whereas the skill set that they left behind is what created the, the new industry now, which is I think much more sustainable. It's a very attractive place with very sort of rich lore and I love that, that Paul Young and, and Tom Moore are kind of tapping into that, this amazing sort of Irish folklore. I've actually written a live action screenplay that I set up at Disney that's all based around you know Irish fairies and banshees and, and it, I think it's just so rich. But I think we've always been known as good storytellers, we always, you know, <laughs> we can tend to act out a story a little bit if we're, if we're really getting into it. And in many ways, like animation is just telling stories, but not just animation. I think getting into a room and convincing people to give you millions of dollars and make a TV show, you've got to have a really good story 
you got to you got to have people like you you got to have people want to work with you so i think our storytelling comes in very handy when it comes to selling ourselves internationally amazing for a small country you know like ireland with with a small industry that's still growing you know to be producing sort of the the caliber of material that it is and really making a mark irish work looks very well um, and could stand up with the best in the world. Uh, Ireland isn't a backwater in turn in the animation world. Ireland's at the forefront, along with a number of other countries, but Ireland is right up there. You can't force these things to happen, and you can't recreate them, you know, in some sort of, you know, uh, synthetic way. It has to be organic, and it just was. It was just all, everybody, the right kind of attitudes, the right type of people, the right types of mixes of talents. We actually have, you know, graduates from Valley Firma, graduates from IDT who are like doing brilliant things around the globe uh, in animation and VFX and related industries. So there were people there we could reach out to, to come back and do talks. Um, so that's something we set about doing. Did the Galway Film Festival this year, the lad that won the shorts came up to me afterwards and said he was in Dunleary, I think it was, and I went and spoke at Dunleary and he said he was going to leave, he was bored or he didn't think it was that. And then I, I, I was there, spoke about just commitment to animation it doesn't matter, you know, whatever what anybody else gets out of it. So long as you feel you've told your story honestly and you put it up there and you can be proud of it. He, he gave me the credit for, for for the fact that he stuck around. That's an amazing thing that there's a moment at home where you can go and work on a feature or in, in commercials. None of that existed. None of it, not a thing. None of that existed at home. Talk about being back in Bally Fermi. Uh, in the early days to think you'd end up with, working with Imagineering to design a land for Disneyland. That just, you know, that's crazy stuff. Every so often somebody will go, I just checked out your LinkedIn. <laughs> You've been everywhere. I was like, yeah. Yeah, and then when I look at it, I go, oh, shit, yeah, shit, yeah, really. We, we organised a one-day animation event a few years ago um, with the IFI, and... Um, you know, one of the things that came up on that day was there was a talk a bit, a bit around the kind of golden era of Sullivan Bluth and someone in the audience, I think it might be Carl Gaffney, you know, actually said, and rightly so, you know, this is the golden age of animation in Ireland. The good thing about it is, if I want to go home to Ireland now, it's about to be a gig for me. <laughs> All right, I've had enough of LA. No more sun for me.